Good morning and evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on Trusted Digital Traces on ESG from Farm to Consumer. I'm your host, Gabriela Cabezas, a Global Market Analyst in the Intelligence Department here at Trich. We have a very diverse group here today at various time zones across the world. We're very excited to have you join us today. For the most optimal viewing experience, please click on the View Options menu at the top of your Zoom meeting window and enable the side-by-side -side mode to view both presentations and our speakers during the event. We have real-time translations and transcriptions in English, Spanish, French, and German. Select Show Closed Captions and then select Translations Options for Closed Captions and choose the language that you want the speech to be translated to. If you need any technical help, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your window at, and a Trich a team member will assist you as soon as possible. Welcome to the webinar on Trusted Digital Traces on ESG from Farm to Consumer. We look forward to a lively discussion on this topic. Before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about Trich. Trich is a leading global sourcing and market intelligence platform. Our intelligence and data provides qualitative and quantitative data on food agri and agriculture to provide comprehensive solutions for our users. Some of the intelligence we provide includes, but is not limited to local insights, trade analysis, data analysis, price data, weather data, trade data, and reports to help clients make informed decisions. If you would like to learn more about Trich's intelligence and solutions, please feel free to reach out to us via email or feel free to post questions here on the chat. After this webinar is over, you will receive a certificate of participation for your records if you fill out our survey. We're introducing Trich Exhibition 365, revolutionizing the way of doing business in agriculture. We have created an agribusiness ecosystem in over 60 countries, meaning we can offer a powerful way to help growers and exporters meet the right buyers globally. Our data allows us to help you target specific buyers by matching purchasing requirements with your products. Trich platform can promote your brand and products to particular importers and retailers through B2B marketing. Trich can get you discovered by verified buyers anytime and set up one-on-one -on -one meetings to accelerate your export growth potential. We are holding Trich Exhibition 365, sponsored by Alfoa. To briefly go over the agenda for today, we will look over ways to achieve company targets and improve operational efficiency in ESG framework, importance of regulatory compliance, and later we will hold a panel discussion and a Q&A session. As I previously mentioned, my name is Gabriela Cabezas and I'm a global market analyst here at Trich. Today, we have a wonderful team of experts that will help us analyze our topic, Trusted Digital Traces on ESG from Farm to Consumer. First, we have Susanne Monet, the CEO of Farmers Connect. We also have Benjamin Laken, a global market analyst here at Trich. Alper Kurd, a global supply chain manager from Turkey here at Trich. And Guilherme Rua, an engagement manager from, uh, for Portugal and Spain here at Trich. During the webinar, if you have any questions that you hope to be addressed, please send them on the chat and they will be looked at during the Q&A session. Now we welcome Benjamin Laken, who will present on ways to achieve company targets and improve operational efficiency in the ESG framework. Hello, Ben, please take over.
Thank you, Gabby. Um, yeah, today we will, uh, I'll provide a brief overview of uh, what ESG is, and then we'll discuss the benefits of incorporating uh, ESG into your business, um, as well as the, the ways to go about doing that. We'll have a brief look at the um, ESG frameworks and standards, and then we will discuss the importance of regulatory compliance when it comes to ESG and the state of regulatory compliance um, in different parts of the world. Um, so let's start with what ESG is. So ESG is an acronym uh, that stands for Environmental, Social and Government uh, Governance and is a framework that companies use to evaluate performance um, in these three areas. So ESG helps stakeholders understand how an organization is managing their risks and opportunities uh, related to these three areas, which is environmental, social and governance uh, and the criteria for these three um, areas. So ESG criteria uh, are used by investors and analysts to assess a company's sustainability and their long term financial performance. Uh, so companies with strong ESG performance uh, may, may be more attractive to investors who prioritize uh, sustainable and socially responsible investments. And ESG is also becoming uh, more important to consumers uh, who prioritize uh, sustainability, both in a social um, and an environmental and in an ethical uh, management perspective. Uh, so first, I want to discuss the, the environmental side of it and cover the, the environmental aspect. Um, which, uh, so you can go to, to the next slide, please. Um, the environmental aspect of, of ESG refers to the impact that a company has on its natural environment. Um, and this can uh, relate to its energy consumption. So companies can uh, focus on improving energy efficiency, transitioning to renewable energy sources, or implementing uh, energy management systems to improve other uh, energy consumption. It also includes greenhouse gas emissions, uh, where a company can set targets to reduce um, emissions, um, implementing carbon pricing or investing in uh, renewable energies uh, to bring down their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it also relates to water use, where companies can implement water management systems, invest in water saving technologies, uh, and source from sustainable water sources to improve this aspect. Um, it also relates to waste management, where companies can implement waste management systems, uh, focus on recycling, uh, composting in the agricultural industry, and the reduction of packaging materials. Um, it also relates to biodiversity, um, where companies can improve their sustainable sourcing practices, invest in conservation efforts, um, and refor um, support reforestation, or at the very least, um, Defore, not deforestation. Uh, the next aspect is the, the social side of, of ESG, which refers to a company's impacts on society and how a company manages its relationships with stakeholders, uh, including its employees, its customers, suppliers, and communities. Um, this, this includes labor standards. A company can evaluate its labor practices and take steps to ensure fair treatments of its employees. Uh, such as working fair working conditions, fair and safe working conditions, fair wages and benefits. Um, it also relates to diversity and inclusion. A company can evaluate its policies and practices related to diversity and inclusion and take steps to promote uh, a diverse and inclusive workforce, um, such as implementing anti-discrimination policies, um, promote diversity in hiring um, and provide training on unconscious bias, for example. It also relates to human rights, um, where companies can um, ensure uh, not to use child labor or forced labor um, in their own businesses, as well as in the supply chains that they make use of. Uh, it also relates to community engagement. Uh, so companies can evaluate uh, how they engage with their local communities and take steps to support these communities um, in which the companies operate, such as investing in local education, uh, or supporting local charities. Um, and the last aspect, the last social aspect is uh, customer privacy and data security, where companies can take steps to ensure uh, they protect consumer data and prevent data breaches. Um, the last aspect is governance, um, which refers to the systems and processes that a company has in place 
uh, to ensure accountability, uh, transparency, and effective decision making. And this includes um, things like board diversity and independence, where a company can ensure that they uh, ensure diversity on their board, um, such as appointing more women or minority directors and separating uh, the roles, say, of the CEO and the board chair to ensure independence. Um, it can look at executive compensation um, and their compensation practices to make sure that their compensation of executives aligns with ESG performance and where executives are awarded for um, ensuring ESG compliance. Um, it, it includes risk management, where companies can take steps to manage ESG, risk, ESG risks effectively, such as implementing a risk management framework. Uh, that includes um, ESG factors. Um, it, it relates to stakeholder management, uh, where companies can evaluate uh, the practice um, uh, or take steps to ensure effective um, engagement with stakeholders, such as establishing formal mechanisms for stakeholder feedback um, and re um, ensuring regular engagement with, with relevant stakeholders, whether that is uh, consumers or their communities. And also include uh, anti-corruption and ethics, um, where companies can make sure that they do not engage in any corrupt uh, activities, um, review their ethics policies, and take steps to ensure um, that, uh, say, whistleblowers are protected um, and that their code of conduct is up to standard. Um, so there's quite a bit of benefits. There's quite a few benefits for companies to uh, to incorporate ESG factors. Um, or ESG into their uh, business management practices. And this includes environmental benefits, social benefits, as well as uh, financial benefits. So when it comes to environmental benefits, the company can reduce its uh, carbon footprint. It can minimize environmental degradation and increase, decrease the negative uh, impact uh, of unsustainable processes. It also has social benefits. Um, and companies that prioritize and implement ESG standards are more likely to attract, engage, and retain uh, top talent, uh, boost employee satisfaction and productivity, uh, promote workplace diversity um, and equity and inclusion. And lastly, um, it also has um, financial benefits. So integrating ESG factors um, can help a company be more competitive in its environment, uh, create new business opportunities, it can also increase operational efficiency, reduce costs, and enhance the company's reputation in the marketplace. Uh, now the question is, how do companies go about um, achieving ESG targets? Uh, and the first step is to develop a clear ESG strategy. So companies should develop um, a clear ESG strategy that sets out their goals, uh, their targets, and their timelines for achieving these ESG-related objectives. Uh, and this strategy should be aligned with the company's overall business strategy and communicated effectively to all stakeholders involved. The second step is to embed ESG considerations into decision making, um, including product development, supply chain management and capital allocation. Uh, the third step is to actively monitor and measure ESG performance using relevant metrics and benchmarks. And this will help uh, companies identify areas for improvement and track progress over time. Um, and the last point is uh, for companies to engage with stakeholders regularly. Uh, and these stakeholders include investors, uh, customers, employees, and communities. Uh, and this will help companies understand stakeholders' expectations and incorporate these stakeholder feedback um, into their ESG strategy. I want to focus on one aspect of this um, a little bit more, and that is monitoring and measuring ESG performance. So monitoring and reporting ESG performance is essential for companies to track their progress um, towards ESG targets and identify areas for improvement um, and communicate the ESG performance to stakeholders. And there are some ways that companies can monitor and report their ESG uh, performance, which include uh, the development of uh, relevant uh, ESG metrics based on the nature of their business and their ESG objectives. Um, and these metrics should be specific, measurable, and there should be a timeline set to these. Uh, the second um, way is to integrate ESG into existing um, data systems. And this includes financial reporting, risk management, uh, performance, and performance management systems. 
Um, the third is to conduct regular audits of their ESG performance and ensure that they are meeting their ESG targets and comply with, regu um, with regulations. Um, the third one is to report on ESG performance to the relevant stakeholders, whether that is internally or externally to, uh, to customers. Um, and the next step is to engage with stakeholders and then to use external frameworks and standards um, to make to benchmark against and to make sure uh, that they're up to standards. And that is the next aspect that I want to touch on is the, the ESG frameworks and standards uh, that there are out there. So there's a difference between ESG frameworks and ESG standards. So framework is uh, broad in scope and it gives a set of principles uh, to guide and shape the understanding of a topic. Um, so it's more, it's a broad, it's broader in nature um, and it will give direction to ESG reporting where standards are more specific in their focus and they contain detailed criteria explaining what needs to be reported on. Um, so a framework is pretty much the, the, the guiding direction where the ESG standard is more specific when it comes to um, what, what goals uh, should be strived for and should, what should be achieved. Um, and the, um, the most prominent uh, ESG frameworks and standards out there are um, Global Reporting Initiative, or just some examples of the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, Sustainability and Accounting Standards Board, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, and then also the United Nations Global Compact. Now, the next question uh, is, uh, is how important is ESG reporting and is it compulsory? Is compliance to regulate to ESG regulations uh, compulsory? Um, and that is a bit of a new, it has a bit of a nuanced answer. Um, the answer is yes and no. And it depends on industry, but very importantly, it varies by, uh, by country to country or global regions. So in the US, for example, there is, um, currently no real mandatory ESG disclosure at the federal level. So ESG requirements has predominantly been market led and not enforced by, by regulation. Whereas in the European Union, for example, um, the several ESG uh, related regulations have been introduced in recent years. And that includes um, the sustainability and finance disclosure regulation, uh, non-financial reporting directive, shareholder rights directive, and then uh, the European Green Deal, where um, the EU deforestation regulation is probably the most prominent and uh, um, relevant and most recent uh, big one that has come out there, which is impacting uh, several industries and it's having far reaching consequences uh, to producers all, uh, all over the world. Um, so ESG compliance is not necessarily compulsory, but it is in all regions of the world, but it is becoming an increasingly important, um, in, increasingly important to incorporate it into to businesses. So let's look at the importance of uh, of regulatory compliance. We can look at uh, first. I have a look at the benefits of regulatory compliance, and overall ESG compliance um, can have significant benefits to to. Uh, to companies, uh, and this includes improved reputation. So companies that um, have a high ESG score or are ESG compliant can be seen as more responsible, both in a social and an environmental way, and more trustworthy, which can lead to improved reputation and include customer loyalty. Um, it can lead to increase, increased stakeholder engagement, uh, such as with customers, employees, and investors which can improve, lead to improved relationships and increased trust. So both from an investor and employee uh, in customer perspective, it can reduce uh, regulatory and legal risks. So it can, um, where it, where compliance is uh, regulated and compulsory, it can lead to less legal uh, risk in terms of fines, penalties, and legal action. Um, it can improve, have improved uh, risk management implications. Uh, it can increase access to capital as a lot of investors, big investment firms, and um, also lenders uh, are prioritizing ESG uh, compliant uh, companies and they are allocating certain portions of their investment funds 
to, to say, ESG uh, compliance. So it can increase access to capital and it can also improve financial performance. So it can help achieve long-term financial success as companies that are ESG compliant are better positioned to identify and manage risks. Um, and it can also have many uh, downsides or risks relating to, to non-compliance in both the financial and the sustainability um, aspect. So it can lead to reputational damage. Um, so companies uh, that are non-compliant uh, can be seen as not caring for the communities that they're operating, not caring for the environment that they're operating. It can also have legal and regulatory risks, which in, just as we just discussed in terms of fines, lawsuits and penalties, it can increase your cost to capital as investors prioritize ESG compliance. It can lead to supply chain risks uh, as companies might not want to work with a company uh, that are not seen as ESG compliant and it can lead to a loss of business opportunities. Um, and then let's have a look at the uh, regulatory guidelines for ESG compliance. We briefly touched on, on that. Um, I think we can, we can move on to the next slide. I want to look at uh, um, the, diff yes, that one, the, how it differs between different world regions. Um, so, we briefly touched on this before, but the regulatory guidelines for ESG compliance vary drastically by country and by region. Um, and over, but overall regulatory guidelines for ESG compliance are evolving rapidly um, and companies need to stay up to date with relevant regulations in their jurisdictions. Um, and companies that prioritize ESG compliance are um, more likely to comply with relevant regulations, build trust um, and so the European Union is kind of a leading, the leading global region uh, for ESG compliance. Um, and the, ESG, the EU has introduced several regulations related to ESG, um, such as sustainable finance disclosure regulations, the taxonomy regulation, uh, non-financial reporting directive. So there's quite a lot of regulation that have been introduced in, uh, in the EU. Um, but whereas in the United States, the, the SEC has uh, issued some guidelines for public companies to disclose uh, ESG risks and opportunities, but it has not introduced any mandatory disclosure at this point. Uh, the UK has introduced some uh, regulations related to ESG, such as the streamlined energy and carbon reporting regulations. Uh, Japan has also um, introduced some guidelines for asset managers. Uh, and the Australian Securities and Investment Co um, Commission has issued guidance for companies to disclose ESG risks. So it's becoming um, regulatory compliance becoming more and more important, um, not just in the European Union, but in other parts of the world as well. Um, and the question becomes how important uh, is ESG compliance for investors um, and then for consumers as well? So it's becoming increasingly important for, for investors um, as they look at long-term financial performance. Um, they're realizing that companies who incorporate ESG factors are more sustainable um, in the long run and have good long-term financial performance. They're looking at risk management um, as well as so companies um, who are not ESG compliant and may face regulatory fines, reputational damage, supply chain disruptions. So to minimize risk, um, they're also looking at ESG compliance. Um, many investors are increasingly interested in investing in companies that align with their own values and belief. So re responsible investing is also becoming more important than regulatory compliance as well as, well as reputation management. So overall, ESG compliance uh, is becoming increasingly important for investments, uh, investors and big investment funds are allocating certain portions of their investments uh, explicitly to ESG compliant companies and lenders are also uh, prioritizing uh, ESG compliant businesses. So the next question and the last one I want to cover is how important is ESG compliance for consumers? Um, and here the question is very similar to the one for investors, is that ESG factors are becoming increasingly important to consumers as they prioritize socially and environmentally um, 
uh, responsible companies. So they want to be more socially and more environmentally uh, responsible in their purchases. So they're looking at the environmental impact of their purchases. They're looking at the social impact of their purchases and they expect transparency from companies. They want to know where their uh, where the products that they purchase are coming from. Um, and that is uh, more relevant than anything else, I think, in the agricultural sector, where we're actually consuming the products that we buy. We're putting it into our bodies. I think consumers are uh, becoming increasingly aware um, of the impact that uh, the products that they consume have. And they're becoming, uh, so it's becoming more and more important for uh, consumers as well. So just to recap, um, uh, on everything is that ESG is a framework that companies can use to evaluate their performance on environmental, social, and government um, perspectives. And it can have significant benefits uh, to companies to comply with uh, ESG. And this includes environmental benefits, social benefits, as well as financial benefits. And there are also significant downsides to companies who do not comply. Uh, which is reputational risks, there's legal risks, as well as financial implications. Um, and the conclusion here is that ESG compliance is becoming increasingly important um, from a regulatory perspective, um, from an investment and lending perspective, as well as from a consumer perspective. So ESG is just going to become more and more important uh, going into the future. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time. Um, Gabby, back to you. Thank you, Ben, for your overview on trusted digital traces on ESG from farm to consumer. It was definitely a, a great and explanatory presentation. Uh, now we will move forward to the panel discussion. Again, during the panel discussion, if you have any questions, please post the questions on the chat and we will address them during the Q&A session after the panel discussion. Please welcome our panelists for today. We have uh, Susan, we have Alfred, and we have Guilherme uh, that I previously introduced on this meeting. So please welcome our panelists and hello everyone. Can you please introduce yourself before we jump into questions? Hello. Susan, hello, can you introduce yourself please? Yes, sure, with pleasure. My name is Susanne Emone. I'm CEO of Pharma Connect, and I'm uh, very, very happy to be here today in the panel discussion, which, in my opinion, really addresses one of the most important topics of today's world, and this is sustainability and how we can actually get there. Thank you, Susanne. Alpert, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining and happy Ramadan feast to my Muslim friends all over the world. Uh, I work as a global supply chain manager at Rich. I'm responsible for exporting quality products at affordable prices from Turkey and ensuring the, their smooth arrival at the destination ports and also responsible for getting more of our exporters to jo join our pl platform. Thank you, Alfred. Guilherme, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Hello, my name is Guilherme. I'm an engagement manager for Portugal and Spain at REACH since 2021. Uh, I've been working on seafood for the past 10 years, uh, firstly with my own startup company, uh, farming and breeding oysters in Portugal, and then as a business manager uh, in a Seabream offshore farm. Uh, in Treat, um, I'm working with um, some big importers in, in Portugal and Spain for seafood. And I must deal, I'm mostly dealing with uh, salmon, either farmed or wild, and some other seasonal products like brown crab, ribbon fish, and that's it. Seafood is my comfort zone. Thank you so much, Guilherme. Let's jump into our first question so our panelists can answer. So our first question is, who can benefit from blockchain technologies in the farm to consumer chain? Susan, would you like to get us started? Sure, and with pleasure. Um, 
Well, it's clear uh, supply and value chains from form to fork, uh, fork are very complex and they consist of very many different players. So we have the farmers, uh, they obviously have different needs than cooperatives would, and then exporters, then importers. So all of these are very different and also have very different infrastructure. If now we want to foster any improvement here, um, be that of environmental nature, be that of social nature, so fair sal salaries, uh, avoidance of child labor, it's clear that there needs to be a common understanding of the current status as well as an idea of the impact that is actually targeted. I mean, we have heard before between consumers, but also regulation and governments, there is a lot of drive towards sustainability. However, at the moment, there is very little trust into the data that is actually available on sustainability. And this is actually where blockchain comes to play. I mean, at base, blockchain is just a technology that creates traces or data points that cannot be changed without leaving clear evidence. So we are applying blockchain in traceability in order to allow the different players across the supply chain to actually trust each other. I mean, here very often we don't speak about linear supply chains, right? We don't have one farm that sells to one cooperative, that sells to one exporter, that would sell to one importer, to one trader, to one uh, processor, and then to one brand. It's many different entities to many other different entities. And while you may now your direct supplier, you have no idea of every single player around this whole value chain. And with a blockchain based solution, you can actually trust that any data point that has been put into the system from the start can be non altered and therewith trusted all the way to the consumer. And this is how blockchain really is a, a massive enablement factor in this in this very complex environment. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Alpert, would you like to elaborate further? Sure. Uh, blockchain technologies can bring benefits to all stakeholders involved in the farm to consumer chain, including farmers, processors, distributors, retailers, and consumers. Uh, blockchain can help farmers by enabling them uh, to prove the origin and the quality of the produce, uh, which can help to increase their sales and revenue. It can also enable them to access new, mar new markets and improve their supply chain management by tracking the movement of their produce from farm to market. Uh, processors can benefit from blockchain by having a transparent and traceable supply chain, which can help them to ensure the quality and safety of the product they produce. It can also help them to reduce waste and improve their in in inventory management uh, by providing real-time information on the availability and location of raw materials and finished products. Distributors can use blockchain to track the movement of the product through the supply chain, which can help them to optimize their logistics and reduce costs. It can also enable them to provide customers with more accurate and timely information on product availability and delivery times. Retailers can also benefit from blockchain by having access to reliable and transparent information on the origin, quality of the products they sell, which can help them to build trust with their customers and increase sales. It can also help them to reduce waste and improve inventory management by providing real-time information on the availability and location of products. Uh, consumers can benefit from blockchain by having access to reliable and transparent information on the origin, quality and safety of the products they purchase. This can help them to make more informed decisions about the products they buy and help them uh, to build trust with the brand and retailers they purchase from. And uh, blockchain technologies can help improve the traceability of the food product, reduce food waste and improve efficiency of, to the, to, of the farm to consumer chain. Uh, may also too expensive for small scale farmers may be difficult to implement in existing systems. Thank you very much. Go on. 
Yeah, okay, I'm, I, I can go on. So, um, so much have been said, and yeah, uh, I want to highlight the headline, which is pretty much everyone will benefit from from this. Uh, in my case, specifically for on the seafood industry, uh, fishermen or uh, aquaculture farmers, to to the processor, distributor, retailers, and of course the the consumers. Farmers, because will improve transparency and efficiency in the supply chain, uh, providing more more information about the quality of their products. Processors will track origin and quality of their raw materials, uh, monitor processes, and ensure compliance. Distribution will optimize logistics, of course, and supply chain operations. Retailers will improve safety of their goods and provide also more information about the origin, the quality, the sustainability of uh, to the to the consumers and will automatically increase confidence among among the consumers. And um, at the end, consumers will be the end of the chain and will feel more confidence and trust uh, in that specific good. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks. Uh, it seems like Gabby's having some uh, technical issues on her side. Uh, so I'll facilitate um, um, until she gets back. Okay. So let's um, let's move on to to the second question. Um, how can traceability and um, digitalization give an advantage in the global uh, in global supply chains? Um, Suzanne, can I ask you to go first, um, or sorry, Kilherme, can you uh, can you continue? Uh, you're already uh, speaking, can you continue on that? Okay, uh, Suzanne, if you want to start, I'm okay, uh, but I can go for it. For it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, the importance of traceability in in the seafood industry, uh, it will allow transparency and accountability during the entire supply chain. It will ensure safety, um, identifying the origin, the risks associated, and the potential exposure to risks and most important will allow a recall if some batch or product uh, has some problem um, we'll ensure also sustainability uh, we, we, we will be able to track the seafood product until until the source um, will be possible to identify um, uh, sustainable fishing prices uh, practices or farming practices um will allow um to know if the product was legally caught or farmed uh, so legal compliance um the adequate labeling promotes confidence uh, among the consumers providing all the info regarding the product um, origin and at the end the confidence always increase sales and um finally it will ensure risk management helps to identify and mitigate risks in the supply chain, such as disruptions, quality issues, or compliance failures. Uh, it can be implemented in the um, in the seafood industry. Um, well, here I will bring it more to my personal experience in a more traditional way. Where I remember when I start my own startup. We, we start to record everything in an Excel file, for example, in a very, very traditional way with less resources uh, to acquire some more sophisticated technologies. Usually, we, we record everything like handling, grading, harvesting, or processing in an Excel file. We can also do it uh, with a barcode or label or uh, labeling. It is more common among the seafood processors and manufacturers. This barcode uh, will contain all the info and it's easy to access with a scan. Uh, a not so common technology in the seafood industry is the RFDI, the radio frequency identification. It's a digital tag. It can be attached to a seafood product or package. Um, and of course the blockchain technology, more modern and the, uh, the future of traceability each transaction, like the ones that I mentioned before, grading or sampling, 
can be recorded in a block. These blocks are linked together and they create an, an alterable chain. Um, in seafood, it's not used too much, uh, in particular in Portugal or in Spain, uh, because well, most of the farmers, or at least the majority of the farmers, are small, and and this this technology has some bottlenecks. Um, uh, so, some softwares, of course, Farm Connect works uh, in that, so we want to promote Farm Connect here. Uh, there are other companies working with that. With that. Um, as far as I know, and Suzanne will correct me later if I'm wrong. Uh, Farmer Connect blockchain platform uh, software is very user friendly and customizable, can be adjusted to each specific business, um, allows to track the origin at every moment in the supply chain, monitor quality in real time, provide consumers with more info about sustainability and social impact, uh, uh, improve transparency and efficiency and reduce waste and ensure compliance with the regulation and industry standards. Uh, this technology, uh, Suzanne already mentioned before, uh, it's also very particular because it ensures that the data record is tamper-proof and transparent. Uh, but uh, of course, has some bottlenecks. It's time-consuming, uh, requires a lot of time to initiate the process of traceability. Um, so the data collection, so every step needs to be registered if we want to start a traceability protocol. Usually on small size companies, they don't have the, the resources to spare uh, for this work, but at the long term will increase, of course, um, in the supply chain efficiency, reduce waste and, and transparency and confidence. Uh, it, sometimes it's, it's challenging to integrate with the existing system and the change from a simple Excel file to a modern software like this could be could be ch challenging. Uh, of course, Excel, it's much cheaper than any software like that. And, and it makes much more sense, of course, if it's adopted by all the participants in the supply chain. Otherwise, it will be challenged to get the full benefits of it. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much my opinion regarding question, this question, yeah. All right, yeah. thanks, Guilherme. Uh, Alper, uh, can I hand over to you? What is your opinion about uh, traceability and, um, and, the, and the advantages that it gives in the global supply chain? Yeah, this can provide several advantages in global supply chain, including uh, digitalization, can uh, provide real-time visibility, into the movement of goods throughout the supply chain. Uh, this can help to identify bottlenecks and delays and enable proactive problem solving uh, by digitizing processes and using technologies such as blockchain and RFID. Supply chain partners can streamline their operations and reduce costs. This can enable them to operate more efficiently, efficiently and effectively. And traceability and digitalization can provide detailed information on the origin, quality, and safety of the products. This can help to ensure that products meet regulatory standards and customers' expe ex expectations. And by providing real-time visibility into the supply chain, uh, this can help to identify and manage risks such as disruption, fraud, and counterfeiting. And uh, also, this can provide a competitive advantage by enabling supply chain partners to differentiate themselves from their competitors by offering greater transparency and efficiently. They can attract and retain customers and suppliers. Uh, this can help to promote sustainability in the supply chain by enabling partners to track and reduce their environment environmental inspect, uh, improve labor conditions and promote ethical sources. Uh, this can improve the efficiency of global supply chain to reduce costs and increase profits and improve customer sat satisfaction. Also, as I mentioned before, 
this can be expensive to implement and can be difficult to maintain for some markets. All right, thank you, Alper. Um, uh, Suzanne, uh, how, in your opinion, how can traceability and uh, digital technologies uh, give an advantage in the global supply chain uh, or the supply chains that companies operate in? Um, maybe first of all, let me briefly um, mention, I'd love to uh, speak a little bit about the solution afterwards before we come to a case study and just share with you a little bit um, and address some of Guillaume's and Alper's uh, thoughts on complexity and how difficult the system deployment is, especially when you look at first mile, because I think those are really the, the topics that work us every day. And um, this is something that we that we deeply care for and about at, at PharmaConnect. And um, but first coming to the question on traceability and digitalization, why is this even so relevant in global supply chains? And at base, I mean, I mentioned before, right, this is a complex beast. There's many different entities from a farm all the way to a consumer. There's thousands of miles in between and any product is changing entity over and over and over. So it's really hard to keep track of. Um, for many aspects that may not be a problem, right? I can still check if I buy one um, bag of coffee I know this is one bag of coffee in terms of quantity. I don't need to trace forcibly because I get the quantity that I wanted. In terms of quality, I also can check to a certain extent if it's the right color, if it's the right maturity, the right something, the right weight, the right shape. Now, when it comes to sustainability, I can't check this. How can I see on a product if it really comes from a deforestation free place? How can I be sure that there was no child labor involved? How can I understand, how can I even get an idea of how the water was used, which sort of fertilizers or pesticides have been used for specific products? I, I simply cannot see it. And I can only trust it if there is some sort of trace between the specific product that I'm eating or drinking and where it actually comes from. And this is where traceability and digitalization are just absolutely critical. And um, I believe Ben mentioned in the beginning, and almost all consumers in Europe, as well as in the US, start caring. They want to source responsibly. They, they want to purchase responsibly. And we have to give them the tool to be able to do that. And just to add to this, it's, you know, you see all this consumer drive here. On the other hand, you often have farmers who are operating at the absolute mim minimum of existence. So it's totally clear for us and I think for everybody who's active in these supply chains that this is not where the big investments can happen. The investments have to come from the consumer, from the large corporate uh, corporations, not only cooperatives, from the big brands who actually have the advantage also of placing their products differently. And this is why it's so important to really spin the path from the farm all the way to the fork. And without traceability, there will never be trusted data that can actually enable consumers to do the right thing and there would stimulate the right action on the ground as well. Yeah, that's that's very true. Uh, you mentioned you wanted to, uh, Suzanne, respond to Guilherme and Alper uh, before we move on to the case study. Uh, would you like to do that? Yes, sure, with pleasure. And I think if I, I don't want to take too, too much room, but I'd love to maybe just speak a little bit about Pharma Connect because um, I am quite proud of uh, our little company. And I think many of the concerns that I've heard about just in the discussion now, some of what I've seen in the chat as well, is really topics that are dear to, dear to our heart. And um, so I'd love to just give a brief intro. And Ben, as you have mentioned before, there is a lot of dynamic around sustainability. More than 60% of consumers in the EU care, but you also see many companies really stepping up and putting in a stick in the ground saying, we will be carbon neutral by 2030. You have companies like Patagonia who really care and who do it in all consequence. Companies like Occitan. And lately we are seeing more and more, say, normal companies stepping up as well. I mean, Unilever is starting to seriously care about sustainability, for which reason can be different, right? Maybe it's the consumer need for organic products. Maybe it's another drive behind it. But you see this movement all over the place. And 
you also mentioned the topic around regulation and deforestation as one example. I think it was actually agreed by the European Commission only yesterday. So this is a huge milestone because it even takes some sustainability topics from the nice to have or differentiation to a total mandatory must have. A company is not allowed to import coffee, cocoa, soy, beef related products, timber and wood related products from any origin that cannot prove to be deforestation free. Now, how can you prove that if you don't have a trace? I have spoken to many of the trading houses here in Europe lately, and, and I've asked, how do you do tracing if you don't have a system for it? It takes them on average six hours to build a trace, a manual trace in an audit situation. Six hours for one bag of coffee. Now, with this regulation that has been decided yesterday, there will be 15% of the imported products that will be subject to checks. And I don't know about the resource situation in every company, but it's totally unthinkable that a Nestle or an ADM type of trading house is going to hire 5,000 people in order to provide this manually, right? So traceability clearly is a, is a tool that needs to come. Um, this very complex reality is just calling for this. And this actually is really why Pharma Connect has been founded four years ago. The idea was to create trusted data across these complex supply chains in a, as much as that's possible, simple way. And again, uh, we're speaking from the past, it was about brand positioning. We were speaking now really about impact on the ground. And we're speaking about regulation requirements, which will actually keep companies from being able to do business. And this is something where if you want to bring out a traceability solution that covers all the way from the farm to the consumer, you have to be quite creative. And over the last four years, we've had a lot of different learnings on what the reality out there really is. And one of the topics is addressing, I think, this first mile that uh, I think, Alper, you mentioned it before. The first mile is something that's really difficult, right? We are speaking often about farm level environment with very low literacy rate. People don't have standard internet connections. Many people just have a simple flip phone. So it's clear for us that if we want to make sure that these farmers can be part of a sustainability chain, then we need to make sure that we can give them digital identities without requiring to have complex digital onboarding. And what we have learned, and this is the solution from our side, we have created very simple technology components that you can actually use in the first mile. We actually do have engagement systems where you can engage via SMS. People can have a simple identity based on their cell phone phone number. We have also created offline technology where you have tools where a, a ground worker can go to a specific farm and do an assessment, take in their profile, attach specific certifications, speak up and mention that they, for example, are uh, pesticide free, that they operate without child labor. I mean, all these topics can be onboarded in a super simple tool. And here, to be frank, in our deployments, typically, it's not the farmer who's paying for this. The, the typical incentive has to come from the larger organizations, wherever regulation hits, from the Nestle's, from the large trading houses, and they do. So we, we are working with a um, really great trading group in Japan, for example, who systematically onboards all the different cooperatives on ground level across the world. And this is, this is, yes, a huge investment for them, but they see this paying off as well, because take an example where the more you go towards organic and sustainable farming, the clearer it is that you're exposed to actual weather conditions. Yeah. If, if it's too humid and you can't just put a lot of chemist chemicals on your fields, you're in trouble your harvest is going to be significantly lower and the supply chains will be impacted. Now, with the system of PharmaConnect, we've been able, in many cases already, to identify alternative resources that actually can fill the supply needs. And this is something where there is a huge opportunity for the cooperatives and also for the farms on the ground level as well. So, these data points, please make sure this is not something that just adds complexity and that makes it wild and crazy and too expensive. We really have solutions that are extremely lean. 
as for the second point that I heard, and I believe that was uh, Guillermo mentioning it, you know, it's difficult to integrate different uh, technology components and some data is only there in Excel. Uh, it's also a huge topic that we have faced from the start and we have created very open um, APIs just to make sure Excel data can just be uploaded. And this is not something that requires any sort of manual work. The same, any ERP system can be linked into our system. So as a company, we are seeking to be interoperable. We work with partners. We don't want to be one standalone complex rollout something. We want to work with partners who are trusted. We want to work with technology that exists. And we most importantly want to work with people who care. I hope this gave a little bit of an insight of who we are in Pharma Connect. I'm super happy to speak about this solution in more detail as well. But um, I think for for now, this is maybe a good insight. Yeah, thank, thanks, Suzanne. Um, and as somebody who has uh, who has done some um, uh, regulatory compliance uh, of of traceability and especially sustainability initiatives in primary agriculture, and I've seen how complex it can be. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the fact that you guys are really pushing to make it um, a, a simple and using, um, dare I call it, uh, basic and simple technologies that farmers actually have access to, um, to, to increase traceability um, and, and compliance. Um, and I really love that because I've seen how complex it can be uh, unnecessarily where it could be uh, could, could be very simple um, so uh, let's move on to the case study uh, Suzanne can you uh, can you go first and uh, continue so I, I have um, actually several that I that I would love to speak about and I've picked one um, I almost wonder if I should change last second um, And I'll speak about one that I also really, really care about. Um, we have, we've mentioned the complexity on the ground and how many different players are out there. Um, the real good thing, and um, this also relates a little bit to one of the questions I've seen in the chat, um, are we, is, is Africa, for example, ready to engage in ESG? Um, and I'm extremely proud that as Pharma Connect, we get the chance to work with a company that's called Savannah Fruits Company. It's a Ghana based entity. Um, it was founded in 2006 in or around 2006. And it's a company that's active in the shear supply chain. Shear as for shear butter. Um, it's fruits, it's nuts that actually don't grow on farms, but on public growing grounds. Um, so this is just one of the examples where you see the, the maximum of complexity because you cannot even narrow things down to a farm where you can give a farm identity. You basically have people who walk around in public grounds and pick shear nuts. Now, Savannah Fruits is a company that believes that um, any business can and also should produce social good and contribute to a sustainable planet. This is a great starting point, but how can you do this if the people that you work with are independent people of most of them, you rarely even know the name. To give you an idea of this, just the massive scope, they are working with almost 60,000 shear nut pickers. Those are mostly independent women um, across Africa. And you can just imagine that if you want to drive any sort of improvement, if you want to provide education to allow them to really grow their career, if you want to educate them around organic organic picking practices, you somehow need to get access to them. And um, we are at the moment in a in a quite large project rollout where we are actually providing a digital identity to each of these women to make sure that any of the activities from Savannah Fruits, but also with the backup of all their customers can actually be impactful on the ground. So we are at the moment in the process of onboarding these women. Obviously, this is happening with offline tools. And obviously, uh, this is something that could not be done just by Savannah Fruits alone. There is some uh, large and renowned companies behind this. I think Unilever is probably one that most people are familiar with, but you really see that this full traceability across the supply chain actually from 
the sheer nut picker who doesn't even own a farm all the way to the consumer is something that is the baseline to foster improvement in these organic supply chains. All right, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Gil Adamay, can I give over to you? Uh, your, your, uh, can I give over to you? Okay, okay, perfect. So, um, I will give the case of Bridge, what we are doing. We are importing salmon from, from Chile to, to Portugal and Spain um, with regular inspections of quality inspections at the origin before any loading. And yeah, the, regarding uh, regulation, uh, traceability regulation in, uh, in Portugal and in Spain, they are, they are regulated by EU, EU legislation. There are two main um, important regulations regarding seafood traceability. I will post it in the, in the, in the channel. Um, in a closer look, um, and at the national level in Portugal, the traceability of every seafood product is also mandatory and don't specify which technology or software should be used. And it's more tight as we are closer to the, to the final consumer. Um, and traceability implementations and, those, techno and that, those technologies can change a lot in the seafood supply chain in Portugal, and it will always depend on the size of the of the business and especially of its leaders. So a few companies have implemented um, this kind of blockchain oriented protocols and a lot of, as I mentioned before, are still using some some very traditional ways to to trace. Um, and overall, the, these regulations are designed to, to ensure safety and quality on seafood products sold in EU, while also promoting sustainability and protect consumers' interests. Um, in Treat, we, we trace every deal uh, using our app and our Treat FMS, where we can easily access and track um, the info related to, to the deal and to the supplier and to the buyer. Um, with um, every deal is classified with a, a few number, easy to track. We can have access to origin, destination, quality, products varieties, certifications available for that product. Uh, we have, of course, the invoices and packing list containing the price and the income terms and the batch number and the shipping docs for, for, for container tracking. That's, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Guilherme. Um, Gabby was taking over again, but I think she's having some, some sound issues. Um, Alper, uh, I am going to ask you to take over. Okay. Uh, olive oil is a high value commodity that is often produced in developing countries where supply chain transparency can be challenging. And to address these issues, a group of stakeholders Holders, including oil farmers, processors, traders, and retailers, have collaborated to develop a digital traceability system using blockchain technology. The system enables olive oil producers to track their products from farm to table, providing buyers with reliable information about the origin, quality, and sustainability of the olive oil they purchase. According to a report by the Food and Agriculture Organization, of the United Nations FAO published in uh, 2019, Turkey had implemented a national oil traceability system in uh, 2016, which enabled the tracking of olive oil from production stage to final product. And the, again, olive oil, olive and olive oil exporters association in Turkey has implemented a traceability system that tracks olive oil from production to export and Turkish Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry has implemented regulations and standards for olive oil production 
that require traceability system to be in place. Uh, thus, in Turkey, for uh, counterfeit and low quality olive oil uh, production is prevented, especially in organic production, the traceability rate is increasing significantly. Uh, we told about uh, all the benefits. It's this applies here as well, and these benefits can help improve the competitiveness of Turkish olive oil in the global global market and contribute to a safer, more sustainable, and transparent supply chain by using blockchain technologies to provide trusted digital traces. Stakeholders in the olive oil supply chain can work together to achieve their uh, ESG targets and improve operational efficiency while meeting the regulatory compliance requirements. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry something happened with my uh, technical issues on my side. So thank you, Ben, for taking over. I was listening every answer from Susan, Larry, and Alfred. Thank you so much for answering uh, wonderfully for every question. Uh, we have extended a little bit this webinar uh, because what answers were so wonderful that we didn't want it to cut them short. Unfortunately, we will not have time to have a live Q&A session, but all the questions sent on the chat will be answered via email with, uh, to, to everyone involved in this webinar. So, um, it seems that unfortunately we run a little bit long uh, and we were not able to go through questions live. Uh, however, I want to thank everyone participating on this webinar. Uh, thank you, Susan, Ben, Alfred, Guilherme for your wonderful presentations. Also, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any other questions than the ones already asked on the chat that will be answered via email, also feel free to email us at intelligence at uh, To wrap up quickly, we had an overview of the trusted digital traces of ESG from farm to consumer. The panelists answered uh, questions regarding who can benefit from blockchain technologies in the farm to consumer change, the advantages of traceability and digitalization in the global supply chain and, pre and presented wonderful case studies and, initi and shared some initiatives with us. I understand it was a lot of information. It was definitely very interesting information and we were able to get through a lot on a short amount of time. Uh, presentation slides will be shared on a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours as well uh, with our recording of this session. On a final note, we would like to announce one of our new services here at Tridge. We recently opened up our platform and newsletter to advertising. It is really a great way to get direct access to over 500K monthly uh, subscribers at Tridge.com users, as well as our newsletter um, that is subscriber-based. We have many suppliers, importers, wholesalers, retailers, institutes, and other great organizations in the food business actively use Please close the web. Uh, hey everyone, I think we're still having some some issues with with Gabby there. Um, uh, thank you, <laughs> Gabby. Are you back? Yes, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, I was just mentioning.
We lost Gabby again. No, I think we lost. I think we lost Gabby. Um, I'm just gonna. I'll wrap it up. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, for attending. Um, special thanks to Suzanne for uh, uh, for from for coming from Farm and Connect side um, and your participation here. Thanks to Alper and uh, Guilherme. and then thanks again for everybody for uh, for attending and for listening. I hope it was an insightful um, insightful uh, session for everyone involved. Um, and we apologize for the for the technical issues we had, but uh, I think we we managed to get through it quite well. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, if you have any further um, questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Tridge or to reach out to Suzanne if you have any questions for her specifically. Um, these slides will be uh, available uh, between 24 and 48 hours after this, and we will also respond to all of the questions posted uh, that we could not get to. Um, so thank you very much and uh, have a pleasant day wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.